Please be seated. Great things he has done. What a wonderful Savior we serve. Well, today, as we come to witness the baptism of our sister Nadia, she selected Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 as the passage that she'd like me to preach on. And so I ask you, please, to turn with me there in your copy of the scriptures. Romans chapter 5 at verse 1. Here is the Apostle Paul highlights the first main benefit that comes to us who are Christians because of our justification from God. Paul writes the following and says, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we read the words which say, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, brethren, let's once again pray and ask the Lord's blessings on our time. Let's pray together. Our great God, we are so thankful that we could be gathered together this day in your house to worship you and to bless your name. Indeed, O oh God, you have given us such a heart to want to do this. We ascribe, O oh God, this new heart and desire all to you. We're thankful, O oh God, that for many in this place, you've made us new people in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've saved us. You've given us new hearts to believe and to love you and to want to serve you all of our days. Indeed, O oh God, this is your supernatural work alone, and we bless you for it. And we're grateful, O oh God, again, that we can come this day and have your word before us. And Lord, as we come to your word, we are mindful that a man can receive nothing except it be given to him from above. And so we're asking, O oh God, that you would give us your truth from above even this day, that you would not leave us alone, not leave us to ourselves, but that you would come by the enablement of the Holy Spirit and equip both speaker and hearer alike to receive your word into good and honest hearts. Oh God, give us good and honest hearts, we pray. We ask and plead all of these things in that wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In his excellent commentary on Romans, that great preacher from another generation named Martin Lloyd-Jones said that the world is crying out for peace. He said people are miserable and they are looking for peace and they don't care how they get it as long as they get it. Now, dear brothers and sisters here, this day, as the case was in Lloyd-Jones's day, the situation concerning individuals finding true peace is still the same. I mean, the human search for lasting peace is never-ending. And the sad part of this search is most people never come to realize that the real lasting peace that they need in life is not just some generic peace, no, but rather it's peace with God. It's peace with their maker through Jesus Christ the Lord. Consequently, I completely agree with the theologian named Augustine when he said that our hearts will remain restless until they find rest or peace in God. Well, it is this matter then of peace with God that we come to consider this morning from this first verse in this glorious chapter in the book of Romans. Now to be sure, this chapter is glorious, and this is because it highlights to us the seven blessed benefits that are ours who are true believers. This chapter shows us who are the true people of God, 
that along with us having peace with God, as we'll consider today, we also have access to God, growth from God, we are loved by God, preserved through God, and reconciled with God, blessed be God. Now, recall with me briefly what the apostle has been dealing with up to this point in this letter, up to this chapter. He has been writing about the specific need for and the striking way of our justification of the Holy God. Now, we might wonder why Paul still has this theme of justification upon his mind as he enters into this new chapter. I mean, why speak about this subject again, having already discussed it quite thoroughly? Well, my dear ones here this day, the answer is simple, and it's because this subject is so important. I mean, the doctrine of justification by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone, apart from all of our human works, is in fact at the very heart of the gospel which you and I love, believe, and proclaim. Therefore, we could never hear enough of it. And so as we come then for this morning, to consider our verse in view for our good, I trust, I ask you please to notice with me first in 1A of it the channel of the believer's peace, the channel of his peace. Look again at what Paul says here. He writes first regarding this matter and says, Therefore, having been justified by faith. Now, the word uh, therefore here in the beginning of our passage is a word of conclusion. This is a word which draws the logical inference from Paul's previous instruction and what he's doing here is summing up for us all that he's been speaking of in the previous words concerning the topic of justification. Now having said this, of course, we need to Pause for a moment and ask ourselves afresh what exactly is justification all about? Well, as most of you will know, I'm sure, justification is a legal term from the courtroom setting. Justification is that which speaks about God, the great judge of all humanity, remitting our sins and accounting us as righteous freely by his grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and this because of Jesus' representative law-keeping and redemptive blood-letting on our behalf. This is the case, or as the great Westminster Shorter Catechism rightly says, justification is, quote, an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all of our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight, and this only for the righteousness of Christ imputed or charged to us and received by faith alone. Now, of course, if you and I here this day have not been justified in God's sight, then we are currently condemned by him. I mean, if a person, listen, if you here this day have not been declared not guilty in God's sight, then presently you stand under his just judgment and are liable to his righteous wrath for your violations against him and his holy law. Now, the apostle has already dealt with this matter a bit in this letter. So that if you're taking notes, he says to us, for example, in Romans 1 and verse 18, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, and this against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Paul says, who suppress, who hinder, who attempt to hold down the truth of God in unrighteousness. And then in the same vein, in Romans 2 and verse 12, Paul says there that those who have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Well, 
because all of these things are so. This is why all of us in this place, yes, all people everywhere, desperately need the gospel or the good news concerning Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, here is why. What Paul has taught concerning the gospel in this epistle is so vital. And I say this because the gospel tells us about God's son, Jesus Christ, who in love 2,000 years ago willingly died on the cross of Calvary for sinners and paid their sin debt in full to God the Father so that if they trust in him alone for deliverance from the judgment of God do them because of their sins against him, they can be instantaneously justified, declared not guilty in his sight. Well, perhaps you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, that's absolutely amazing. You say, this is too good to be true. I mean, maybe even you, Nadia, here this day at one time thought this uh, for yourself. Ah, but... Whatever the case might be, dear ones, here this day, I say it's true nonetheless. It's absolutely, it's completely factual. For as the hymn writer correctly says, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Well, as I said uh, just a few moments ago, our passage in view for this morning is highlighting to us this crucial matter. Here is Paul, again in our text, lists the first of the seven glorious fruits that are ours who are true believers. He says that all of it is rooted in the fact that we have been justified in God's sight. Ah, but having said this, we need to ask now specifically, what is the unique channel, the unique conduit, if you will, by which justification is received by us? Well, again, Paul tells us in our passage when he says, look at the words there in your Bibles, he says, having been justified, again, acquitted instantaneously, he says that all of this came to us, quote, by or upon the exercise of faith. Now, here is where you and I need to ask the question, which is, what is faith all about, biblically speaking? And this is an important question for us to answer. And I say this because all kinds of people have all kinds of wrong ideas about what faith is, even in our day. I mean, some think that faith in Jesus is simply believing that he lived and died and rose again, and therefore all is well with them. Ah, but really, church, this is not the case concerning biblical faith. And why? Well, it's because this is only a general, we could say a superficial faith with reference to Christ. But it's not a saving faith, and you and I must know the difference. We must Especially since according to the word of God, faith is the singular instrumental means by which you and I receive justification before a holy God. And so what then does true saving faith mean? Well, if you're taking notes again, saving faith includes three things. Three things, namely, knowledge, belief, and trust. Knowledge, belief, and trust. And trust. Now, this is typically how theologians define true and saving faith based on Scripture. So that, for example, uh, first, one has to have a knowledge about God's holiness and their sinfulness before him. So we have knowledge. Secondly, they must have belief. That is to say, belief that the revelation of God and themselves as found in the word of God is true. And then third, because of this, they must then turn from their sins and trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, whom God sent into the world to die for their sins. And so this then is the essence, is the core, is the heart of the matter at hand. This is the case, or more simply stated, we could say practically speaking, 
that saving faith is the open hand which receives the forgiveness of God toward us, and this is because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Saving faith, uh, simply stated, some of you children here this day, you might not have gotten uh, that more theological definition that I gave a few moments ago, but here's a simple a definition of saving faith, practically speaking. What is it? It's the open hand which receives the forgiveness of God toward us. And this is because of all that Christ has done on our behalf. And so you see, dear ones here this day, saving faith, true biblical faith, which of course is a gift from God, is not a difficult matter to understand, no, for it simply means that having turned from ourselves and all of our self-effort in order to be made right with God, that we then trust in Christ, person and work alone as our only ground of acceptance with Him. Saving faith means that we rest the whole weight of our whole guilty souls upon a whole Christ, saying with the hymn writer of old, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And so this then is what the apostle means when he speaks in our passage about faith being the unique channel of the believer's peace. Faith, not our so-called good deeds, which as we read earlier in our uh, opening time, our deeds are always tainted with sin. So not our so-called good deeds because they're not perfect in God's sight, nor our baptism or anything else in order to obtain justification before a holy God, no. But rather, a simple trust in who and what Christ has done for us, laying hold of him alone just as a ring holds a jewel. Now, of course, not only does the Word of God teach this truth here in our passage for today, uh, but it also teaches it in other places in the book of Romans, many places, so that, for example, Paul could say back in chapter 3 of this book, turn with me there in your Bibles, Romans 3, verses 21 to 26 of this chapter, and speaking about the unique uh, means of our a justification before God. Notice what Paul says, Romans 3, verse 21. He says, but now the righteousness of, or perhaps better stated, from God, apart from the law, is revealed. How, Paul? He tells us. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Here it is. Even the righteousness of God, how is it received? Answer, through faith. Not in ourselves, no, not in our works, no, not in our baptism, no, but through faith in Jesus Christ. To all and on all who do what? Believe. Why, Paul? Well, he answers the question when he says, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified, there's our word, being declared not guilty in God's sight. How? Freely, by his grace. Through the redemption, or the bloodletting, that is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God, that is to say God the Father, set forth as a propitiation, or we might say a wrath absorber, by his blood, note the language, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to what end? Verse 26. To demonstrate at the present time, the Greek is at the now time, his righteousness, that he that is God might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, Nadia, uh, you are one who has put your faith in Jesus Christ with the result being that you are now justified, declared not guilty in the sight of the Almighty God. By His free grace toward you, you have come to see yourself as a spiritually lost individual worthy of God's just judgment. Therefore, you've turned from your sins and you've trusted in Jesus to save you. And being saved, your desire now is to follow Jesus all of your days, thus today, you are now ready to go public with your faith in the waters of baptism 
which is the symbolic ordinance which displays all that I just said. And so, having seen firstly for this morning from verse 1a, the channel of the believer's peace, come with me now secondly, to note back in our passage in 1b of it, the character of it, the character of it. Here, as Paul speaks in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 about the nature of the essence, uh, about the uh, essence rather, nature or essence of the peace which we have as Christians, he writes the following and says, Romans 5, 1b. Note the words there in your Bibles. He says, therefore, having been justified, how he answers by faith. What does he say? We have peace with God. The nature of the peace, the essence of it. It is peace with God. God. Now to be sure, dear ones here this day, this is a beautiful statement. It's beautiful. I mean, here as Paul describes, the very first thing that comes to the justified believer, he says that right at the top of the list is that they, he or she, has peace, has shalom, has harmony with their maker. Now that uh, Paul here in our passage includes himself in the statement, look at the language, we have peace with God, shows us that although at one time in his life he was a very religious man, this did not give him true and lasting inner peace. It didn't. And brethren, I say to you this day that there's a real lesson in this for you and I to learn from all of this, and it is that religion can't save us. It can't save us. Uh, Paul externally was a very uh, righteous man, uh, sought to keep the things of God, sought to be a holy man, externally speaking. Paul, nonetheless, inwardly was a wicked man. Paul was a sinner. Paul said, I had not known but that the law told me that you shall not covet that he was a covetous man. Paul said, I saw that the commandments of God were spiritual, not just external. And when I saw that the law of God judged my motives and my intents, I cried out saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. And so you see, even though Paul at one time was a Pharisee, again, a man who did many religious things, this did not make him right with God. Religion can't save us, dear ones. Our attempts to be moral, etc., by outward things, can never make us right with God. No, rather, if we're ever going to be made right with God, God must save us. We need Him to completely change us from the inside out, and this so as to make us new people in His Son. We have peace with God. That happened when Paul became a Christian and not before. Now you should also note here that when Paul says in our passage, look at the language, that having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. The verb we have here is in the present tense, which highlights to us who are Christians that this peace with God, which we wonderfully have, will never end. Here Paul says that, Christians who have put their trust in Christ as their Savior will always have this peace with God and nothing will ever change this fact. Blessed be His name. Now, of course, this language here of peace with God presupposes that before you and I in this place who are believers, that before we were saved, there was a serious problem in our relationship with God, right? A church, uh, this was the case. So that whether we realized it or not, as non-Christians, God was not happy with us. As unbelievers, God was completely at war with us. And this is because we were rebels against God and His holy law. Thus we're told, for example, in Psalm 7, that God was angry with us all the day long, with the result being that Isaiah could say in Isaiah chapter 48 that there's no peace for the wicked, saith the Lord. 
And so you see, church, even though the non-Christian may think they have peace with God, the fact of the matter is, according to the Word of God, this is a false peace. According to Scripture, it's a, de a defective peace, which on the day of judgment will prove to be very unprofitable for them. Well, because this is so, I think that non-Christians intuitively know that they are in trouble with God. I believe that they know that something is not right in their lives. Thus again, this is why Lloyd-Jones was right when he said that many unbelievers are searching for peace at all cost. A church long story short, non-Christians are looking for love in all the wrong places, not knowing that the real love that they need in their lives is to be found in God, who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, here then is what the heart of this language in our passage is all about concerning the character of the Christian's peace. The character of their peace because of their justification is peace with God. Peace with God. It's peace with their maker so that now and forevermore the true Christian is in a fatherly, eternal relationship with the Lord. And so, having seen from our text in view the channel of the believer's peace, faith alone, and its character, peace with God, come with me now thirdly and more briefly to note its cornerstone. Its cornerstone. We ask here, what is the exclusive basis upon which anyone ever receives peace with God? What is its foundation all about? Well, I've already mentioned it. However, here the apostle puts it forth plainly in the last part of our verse when he says that all of this comes to us. Look at his words again with me in your Bibles. He says, through, or better translated, by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now these also are glorious words to be sure. And they highlight to us plainly that our being made right with God doesn't come to us again through self-effort or our works or again baptism, no, but rather it comes to us exclusively through what Jesus did on the cross in our place when he died and paid our sin debt in full to God the Father as our substitute. Oh, dear ones, I say that it comes to us through Christ, who according to Colossians chapter 1, has made peace with God for us through the blood of his cross. Thus he has already obtained for us perfect redemption and reconciliation with God so, the, so that the Apostle Paul could now say in Ephesians chapter 2 that Jesus is our peace. Well, here then is where we end the exposition of our passage for this morning concerning the first main blessing of peace with God that comes to those who have been justified. This is what all true believers have experienced in their life by grace, and this Nadia is what you have experienced as well. And so, as I begin to wind down for today, I want to do so by applying some of what we've seen. Firstly, to you here in this place who are the true people of God, to you who have experienced peace with God, through Jesus Christ the Lord, what can I say to you? Well, there are four things that I want to say. Four things, and the first is, peace with God should produce in you encouragement, knowing that although everything around you might be disturbing your peace, nevertheless, Jesus will continue to give you this peace as you seek him for it. I'll go through all four right now. Secondly, peace with God should also produce in you, dear Christian, here this day a continual pursuing of peace with all the people of God in this place. For if you are at peace with God, then you are to be at peace with others. 
Third, Christian, peace with God should produce in you a readiness to put to death your sins, because if you don't, your peace communion with God will suffer. And then fourth, dear brethren, peace with God should produce in you a continual praise to Christ, knowing that all that you have concerning your relationship with God is because of him. And so let's talk about these one at a time. We've looked at our subject at hand. We've looked at our verse, uh, peace with God, because of our justification through Christ. And so again, how do we apply this to ourselves? What should it produce in us, firstly, who are Christians here this day, for you, my dear brother, my dear sister? Well, the first is, again, that peace with God should encourage you, knowing that although everything around you might be disturbing your peace, Nevertheless, Jesus will continue to give you peace as you seek him for it. Now, as you know, we are living in very uh, troublous times. There's much to disturb our peace on the right and on the left. These are difficult days. No questions asked. We're all experiencing it in various quarters, in uh, the workplace, and uh, just out and about. There's uh, much disturbance to our peace, to our Tranquility, of wars and rumors of wars, etc. All these things constantly going on. A great hatred in our own country, a divide all over the place. And so, friends, again, as we think about our peace with God, that peace which He has blessed us with, that peace like a river, to quote the words of the hymn writer, our peace can be disturbed, or just peace in general. That objective peace, of course, we know with God, will never be disturbed. But subjectively, we can feel like our world is being rocked because of all of the disturbances around us. And so what do we do? Again, when we think subjectively about the peace that God has given to us as his people, well, we go to the Lord Jesus Christ. We go to him asking him for fresh doses, fresh infilling as it were. Of his peace, I asked, what did Jesus say in John 14 and verse 27? Well, there Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give. And so you see, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, is always ready, willing, and able to give the believer the peace that he or she needs. And so again, if you're here this day, you name the name of Christ. You're objectively at peace with God because of what Christ has done. And again, nothing will ever change that fact. But if you're feeling disturbed within your own soul because of all that's going on in the world, maybe things that are going on in your own soul with reference to remaining sin, etc., then I say, dear brother, dear sister, go to Christ. He is the peace giver. My peace I give you. And Jesus will continue to give us his peace, his, his wholeness, his shalom as we ask him for it. We go to him and say, oh, Lord, I am disturbed about this thing or that thing. Uh, whether it's in the home or in uh, my own heart or, again, in the workplace, just being out in the world, etc. Lord, I feel like there's no peace within my heart because of so many trials on the right and on the left. Lord Jesus, give me a fresh infilling of peace, a fresh dose of your peace that I might feel that inner shalom and harmony that I might be tranquil as one of your children. So peace with God should in, produce in us encouragement, knowing that, again, he's always ready, willing, and able to give us peace when we feel like we don't have a sense for it. But secondly, brethren, peace with God should also produce in you and all of us a continual pursuing of peace with all the people of God in this place. Why? Well, the answer is simple, and it is, if we're at peace with God, then we ought to be at peace with one another, right? This is very plain. I asked, what did Paul say in Romans 14 and verse 19? Well, there he writes saying, let us pursue the things which make for what? He says, peace. Let us go after the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. And so if, in fact, we're at peace with God, which is the fact of the matter with reference to the true believer, then he or she ought to be at peace with his brethren. Ought to be at peace with his brethren. But peace with God, the war has ended. The hostility has ceased. 
Well, because I've received peace with God through the bloodletting of the Lord Jesus Christ on my behalf, then I ought to be at peace with all the people of God who have experienced the same. Let us pursue peace. Let us go after peace. And so I ask you, dear member of Grace Community Baptist Church here this day, or others, are you pursuing peace with all men? Peace with the brethren in the church? Are you going after it at all costs? Oh, Lord, I don't want there to be any rift in my relationship with this one or that one. Oh, God, this is not of you. You're not pleased with such a disposition happening among brethren. No, Lord, so help me to pursue peace, to do whatever I need to do to be reconciled with my brother. Doesn't Jesus say that very thing in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5? If you go to the altar to worship God and you are there and you recall that your brother has aught with you or you have aught with your brother, we might say whatever the case might be, go to him, speak to him, speak to her. Be reconciled to your brother, Jesus says, first, and then bring your gift to the altar. And so this is what we need to do. Our peace with God, the peace that he gives us in our own hearts, subjectively speaking, should cause us to want to be at peace with all of the people of God. We may not always be at peace with unbelievers. Of course, we have uh, disturbances between us and them. We serve different gods. We hold to different values, etc. But nonetheless, we're still to love them, even if they are our enemies. We are to love them. We are to pray for them, etc. But especially pertaining to God's people, they're at peace with God, I'm at peace with God, then we ought to, we must be at peace with one another. But thirdly, brethren, peace with God should also produce in us a readiness to put our sins to death, for if we don't, our peace communion with God will suffer. Our peace communion with God will suffer. Now notice I said peace communion, not peace union. Our union with God will never be broken, and blessed be God for this. But our peace communion will be if we are harboring sin, if we're not repenting of our pride and our lust and our anger, etc. That communion that we share with God through Christ by the Holy Spirit, it'll suffer. We will feel that God is distant from us. Now, theologically speaking, that's not true, but this is subjectively speaking. Our communion with the Lord will be hindered. And so if you're here this day and you have unconfessed sin or whatever it might be, I say, brethren, repent of your sin, confess it, go to Christ with it, and ask God to show you fresh communion, to, to give you a sense of his smile upon you. Oh, Lord, I feel like there's a breach between us. Whatever I've done, uh, things I've thought, whatever it might be, Forgive me, cleanse me, wash me, because I want to have, O oh great God, a realized communion with you. And so again, if we're going to have this, what must we do? Repent of our sins. Put to death our sins. Say, no, I'm not going to pursue this thing, because I know every time I pursue this thing, my communion with God suffers. And I say, dear ones here this day, that if you're in a good spiritual state, then the thing that you prize the most in your life is communion with God. It's fellowship with Him. It's that sweet communion and fellowship that you love above all else. And so again, if this application fits you this day, then cry out to God for fresh forgiveness. Ask the Holy Spirit to empower you to put to death that particular sin or sins that might be causing you to stumble in this regard so that you might know fresh communion with the Almighty. And fourthly then, dear brethren in this place, peace with God should produce in you a continual praise to Jesus, knowing that all that you have in your relationship with God is all because of Christ. Look at our passage again. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all because of Jesus 
Dear Christian, hear this day that you are now in a good relationship with God. All because of Jesus. Jesus and Jesus alone. Not because of what you've done, who you are, what you'll do in the final day. No. It's through Christ and Christ alone. Therefore, to Christ and Christ alone be all the praise, glory, and honor. We bless this Savior. We bless this God who sent this Savior. We worship our great God. We love our great God. And here with the emphasis being upon Jesus, the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. And so, dear Christian here this day, do you praise the Lord Jesus Christ for all that he's done for you? Sometimes as Christians we can forget all that Christ has done for us. We are saved for many years. Some of us in this place for decades. And we're just happy. We're saved and we've been reconciled to God. We have peace with Him. And nothing will ever change this fact. If we die, we go to heaven in an instant. It's all true. Ah, but brethren, we must never forget the cost that was paid, the amount, the debt that was paid for us to be in such a state. The great price that was paid through Jesus who died in our room and our stead so as to procure our peace with God. And so I say we must always go back to the cross of Calvary. We must remember that all that we experience now as Christians and then days without end in glory is all because of Jesus. Therefore we should say worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory, honor, and power. What a wonderful Savior we serve. Amen? I mean, it is all because of him, and may it be that from us who are his redeemed ones in this place, that we will give him all the praise which is due his name. And so as I close then this afternoon, I want to speak to any non-Christian here in this place, to you who might be in pursuit of peace, in your own life. What can I say to you, my dear friend, but simply this, listen, you will never know real, lasting, inner, ongoing peace until you come to know it with God through Jesus Christ the Lord. That's it. It's one simple statement. Uh, We could flip it around and say that you will come to know real, lasting, ongoing peace when you come to know it with God through Jesus Christ the Lord. That's it. That's the answer for this whole peace problem in your life. Again, the prophet Isaiah says, There's no peace for the wicked, saith the Lord. The wicked are like the troubled sea which are tossed to and fro. No peace for the wicked, saith the Lord. It's because you don't know God. You don't know God through Christ. And so if you're going to know God through Christ this day, what must you do? The answer of the Bible is plain. Turn from your sins. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ alone for life and salvation. This is the demand of Holy Scripture. This is the command of the Gospel. In the opening hour, I spoke of the Gospel, the good news that we all need because we presently stand under the judgment of God. The Gospel is not bad news. No, the Gospel is good news. The Gospel is centered in the doing and the dying and the rising 
of Jesus Christ our Lord, even as is displayed in the Lord's Supper. The gospel is good news with reference to how it is that guilty sinners can be made right with God. God is holy. We are not. We have sinned against God. We've broken His commandments through our pride and our lust and our covetousness. There are adulteries and fornications and drunkenness, etc. And the holy God of the Bible must punish us for our sins against Him. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's eternal death under God's wrath. That's bad news. So what's the good news? Or I might say, who is the good news? The good news is Jesus Christ. Who in love came into this world to save sinners. Save sinners from what? The judgment of God. How does he save sinners from the judgment of God? Answer, he takes the judgment of God, do them on their behalf. He takes the judgment of God, do them in their place. And that, my dear non-Christian friend here this day, is exactly what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross. The Father laid the sins of sinners upon His sinless Son. And there Jesus offered His soul as an atonement for our sins. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus atoned for the sins of sinners. He propitiated, He quieted once for all time the wrath of God against the guilty. He accomplished deliverance from the judgment of God. Thus he cried out saying, it is done. Paid in full. How do we know God accepted it? Well, after Jesus was buried, the Father rose him from the dead on the third day as his validation to all mankind that my son paid it in full and I've accepted his payment. That's the good news. I deserve to die. I deserve to be punished. I deserve to be condemned by God. But in love, Jesus goes as my substitute and he's condemned by God so that I could go free. That's good news for sure. That's the best news in all the world. And when you open your Bibles and you see the good news of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the word gospel, Matthew, Luke, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the word gospel means good news. The gospel writers have good news for guilty sinners. The good news is that God sent His Son into the world to pay our sin debt in full at the cross. And that's exactly what Jesus has done. And so you say, well, okay, He paid it in full. What must I do to be saved? The answer of the Bible is simple. Repent and believe the good news. Turn from your sins. Turn from all those things that you know God is not pleased with. Cast them far from you. And trust in what Christ has done for people like you. Believe on Him, who He is, Son of God. What He's done, died for the guilty. Accomplished their redemption. The Bible says all who do this will be saved. Which simply means to be delivered from the judgment of God. And so my dear non-Christian friend this day, might you be found repenting of your sins and trusting in Jesus' person and work alone as the only basis of your acceptance 
with God Almighty. Might it be that some here, even this very day, will do this for the first time to the saving of their souls. Let's pray together. Our great God, we thank you that having been justified, we who are Christians have peace with you. A peace which will never end. And a peace which comes to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Great Savior, we bless your name for procuring for us such a wonderful peace at such a great price for yourself. Thank you for giving your all for the likes of us. We bless your name and we worship you afresh. We ask and pray all of these things in your own holy and wonderful name. Amen.